And this year, we're lucky again to have Dr. Jeff Mattis from the Colorado Blood Cancer Institute as our presenter. And then he'll be followed by a patient perspective from Neil Massif. And Neil is a, a veteran, a 20-year veteran of WM. He was an IWF support group leader in New York City. He's been on the board of trustees. And uh, he's also a psychologist, psychiatrist rather, um, a professor of psychology. And both their biographies are in your booklets, so you'll see all the biographies of, of speakers uh, available. And Dr. Mattis will also be uh, running a breakout session on understanding your blood test results at 4.15 today. So if you have any questions about that, don't miss that. And there'll be time for questions after each speech. There'll be microphones that will be brought up closer in, in each of these aisles. You just line up by those microphones and ask questions away. Now, as I said, we're, we're um, lucky to have Dr. Mattis with us today. He actually gave this speech last year, and some of you might have heard it. Uh, he, did, he did pretty well. Uh, <laughs> we, we had to send him to remedial school because we, we asked everybody to rate the, the speakers, and last year we did it on a five-point scale, and five is best, and he only got a 4.93. <laughs> so uh, hopefully he'll be better today. Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Mattis, who will cover the ABCs of WM. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Chicago. I, I was confused coming in here because I, there are two obviously large conventions going on simultaneously in the Rosemont area right now, and I couldn't tell which group was the WM ed forum, which group was the anime uh, uh, costume <laughs> place. So I think, I think this is the WMers, but it was, it was challenging. So uh, I'm, I'm really ha happy to be here. And this is similar to the talk I gave last year, but I had, Sue told me I didn't have to change anything, but I said, you have to change a few things. So I do appreciate feedback. I try to make it, uh, I think this is an important talk for setting the table for the meeting. And, and if, uh, if there's any, any constructive feedback, I really do appreciate it. So the, the goal of today's talk is to um, review uh, WM for the new, the new folks. And I'm going to make sure I hit the right button here. We're going to describe WM for the new WMers, but it's also a basic review course for the veterans because I always say, tell people something once, tell them what you're going to say, tell it to them, then tell them what you just told them. It's always a good way to learn things. Uh, we're going to review the incidents, possible risk factors, and clinical presentation of WM. We're going to explain how it's diagnosed, what the symptoms are, and treatment guidelines. Although the treatment's going to be covered by really smart people later in the day, so the details of treatment will come later. We're going to talk about uh, and how to get, help you guys get the most out of the edu educational forum, which is an amazing way to learn about your disease. So what is Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia? Well, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia is a, is a blood cancer. So I always tell people it's a blood cancer and it's a type of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So you, you are in the class of, of people who have a cancer that originates in the bone marrow, blood, and lymph system. That's what a blood cancer is. And in, in, in the case of WM, uh, there are certain blood cells called lymphocytes, and we'll, I'll show you pictures of these later. And these lymphocytes uh, are also closely related to cells called plasma cells. They're very, very closely related, and they reproduce out of control. In a way, that's the definition of a cancer. They reproduce out of control. The cells, and the, what, what, the way they do that is they don't die when they're supposed to. So normal cells go through a process where they are born, they're made, they live their lifespan, they do what they're supposed to do, do and they die. But part of the way, way that WM misbehaves is that it doesn't do that. And there's a protein called BCL2 that uh, collects inside these WM cells. And you're, and you're going to hear uh, uh, speakers such as Dr. Castillo and, uh, and Dr. Ma later talk about how that might be something that we can exploit when we're looking for new treatments for WM. WM cells make excessive proteins called antibodies. Antibodies are heavy proteins that normally are part of our immune system for fighting infection, but in WM they're abnormal and they don't fight infection, and what they do is they, they cause problems that we'll talk about in a few slides. This disease is named after Dr. Jan Waldenstrom, who's a Swedish oncologist and was first identified 74 years ago, which is pretty, pretty amazing. And I always, uh, I did this last year too, I, I, I get to show this slide first, but I, I suspect every speaker in honor of Dr. Waldenstrom will show this slide. 
and he was just obviously, obviously a very talented physician. So let's back up a little bit and talk about how cancers develop, because when I see patients in the office, uh, they're, they're always wondering, even though they may not ask, they're always saying, why did I get this? How did I get this? How do cancers start? It's natural to think about that, so how, how do cancers start? Well, cancers, normal cells follow rules. So normal cells follow rules that we talked about a minute ago. They live out their lifespan, die, and they get turned over and recycled. And this normal behavior of the cells, the normal lifespan of these cells is governed by specific genes. Genes are packages of genetic material, our blueprint that live inside our cells, and they direct our cells to do what they're supposed to do. And when the genes function properly, the cells do what they're supposed to do. But sometimes mutations occur in these genes, usually by chance, usually by chance. And, and typically when these mutations occur, we have a spell check system. Uh, that, that I rely on tremendously when I'm using my Microsoft Word. Uh, and the spell check almost always corrects these mutations, but it doesn't always correct the mutations. And, enough, and if enough of these mutations take hold, and uh, they can take over the function of the cell, and they can become abnormal. And then they multiply uncontrollably. And that's the definition of a tumor or cancer. The cells then become cancerous or malignant. They no longer follow the rule. That's a basic description of how cancers occur. And it's never any one thing that makes a cancer occur. Usually what we talk about in cancer is that you have to have multiple abnormalities or multi multiple hits in order for a cancer to develop. So what about lymphoma? Lymphoma is a type of blood cancer. And so lymphomas are cancers that begin in a certain type of cell in the blood system called the lymphocytes. And they undergo a malignant transformation uh, and they become lymphoma. And we know that many lymphomas are due to specific genetic mutations, including WM, but not all of them have been, there are many lymphomas where we haven't identified specific genetic mutations. There are dozens and dozens of kinds of lymphomas. And so whenever a patient says, I have lymphoma, I always say, what kind? I have non-Hodgkin lymphoma, what kind? I have B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma, what kind? And I'll show you a slide of that later. So we classify these lymphomas based on the type of lymphocyte, which is their origin, that turns cancerous. And so we are, in general, generally speaking, it's either B-cell, T-cell, or Hodgkin lymphomas. They're the most common examples of, these, of, of, of lymphoma. So this is a list of, uh, of uh, very, in one of our journals called Blood, it's a great journal if you're looking for something to read, it's what we all read, and, uh, and this is a, pulled out of blood, this is just a table of all the lymphomas, and so if you could just take, commit that to memory, that'd be great, but this, this is you, you guys are right here. So this is just you among all these lymphomas. So whenever you say, again, I have lymphoma, it's important to know your kind of lymphoma. So this is a slide of, uh, of, of how blood cells develop. So they all start from what's called a stem cell. Now, when blood doctors talk about stem cells, we're not talking about those guys advertising on TV, injecting stuff in your joints and relieving you from suffering from your back pain and so forth. We're talking about blood stem cells, cells that are destined to make all the different types of blood that we have. And so it starts off as a common stem cell. These are all the different kinds of cells that we need to live and function and be healthy every single day. And the stem cell is, is like the perfect manufacturer. It keeps perfect inventory. If we need more of these guys, it'll make more of these guys. If we have enough of them, it'll slow down the production. It does these for all these cells. But if a mutation occurs in one of these cells over here, and this cell, a group of cells that are at this stage say, you know, I don't feel like following the rules, uh, and then what can happen is you can develop overproduction of certain types of cells, and that's what happens in WM. In WM, now, and if you have mutations that occur and they lock things up at this level here, you can have acute leukemia or really, really aggressive types of non-Hodgkin lymphomas. If the mutations mostly result in an accumulation of cells that are more mature or more developed, such as down here, then you have usually a more indolent, slow-growing, or mature type of lymphoma, and Waldenstromus falls into that category. So Waldenstromus is a blood cancer of these B lymphocytes down here, and then these B lymphocytes are closely associated with these, with these cells called plasma cells. And indeed, in Waldenstromus, we have collections of both of these inside the bone marrow. That's a hallmark of the disease. I'll show you a picture of that next. 
So this is a picture of a bone marrow biopsy, and if you've been diagnosed with Waldenstrom's, then you have had, by definition, a bone marrow biopsy performed. And when you do a bone marrow biopsy, you, you put the slides out on a, on a you, you smear the cells on a slide, you stain them and examine them under a microscope, this is what you see. So what you see is you see, uh, there's a, a few basic rules of thumb. Blood is not that difficult. If the cells all look the same, something's wrong. Usually there's a nice mix of different cells. Here they all look the same. Uh, they're all blue and we always say blue is bad. Uh, when we're looking at, at, at cells, and these are all identical cells, and these are Waldenstrom cells here, all these guys here. And when we uh, look at those cells a little uh, more closely, what you see is you have a mix of these cells called lymphoma cells, and then when they become a little bit more mature and really start making the IgM, then there's these mix of plasma cells too, but these guys are they're related, they're, they're, they're blood relatives, they're derived from the same abnormal mutations, although they look differently under the microscope, they have the same genetic mutations inside them. So this is what we see when we look at uh, a bone marrow of a WMR. So what is Waldenstrom's? So Waldenstrom's is a rare disease, and that's why it's so amazing to come to a conference like this and have someone who's got a disease that literally is a, we can't say one in a million, we have to say three in a million uh, disease, uh, and see so many patients here at this conference. And so in, this, in the U.S. there are 1,500 cases a year. Now the other disease that I spend my day uh, treating is called multiple myeloma. We see about 20 to 25,000 cases a, a year, and I always say myeloma is 1% of all, of all cancers. And so you have a pretty rare disease. The median age is 64. Uh, like any, any self-respecting cancer, it affects men more than women. Uh, and uh, Caucasians uh, more than non-Caucasians. And what's interesting about WM is that there, there's a familial disposition seen if you dig deeply enough in about 20% of cases. How do we know that? We know that because uh, at the Dana-Farber in Boston, they've done such great research in this field. And several years ago, Dr. Treon and his staff examined uh, about 250 patients and they did very, very careful family histories. Uh, and I'm going to show you this. This is a, called a pie chart here. And so the, and if you look, 83% of the, I believe that's 83% of the patients, 81, 83, uh, when you dug deeply, you found no history of any other blood cancer. But in the remaining roughly 20%, you found a mix of different types of blood cancers, and they're all, for the most part, they were B-cell blood cancers. Now, several of these were WM, this piece of the pie right here, but some had multiple myeloma, some had chronic lymphocytic leukemia, some had MGUS, some had acute leukemia. There is a mix of different diseases in there. So it's very, it's very important when you're diagnosed with WM to uh, share your family history with your physician. Um, how do we define WM? Well, do, so doctors get together and they decide for someone, in order for someone to be diagnosed with WM, they have to meet certain minimum criteria. What are those criteria? Number one, you have to have a bone marrow biopsy that shows lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma cells, those cells that I showed you in that biopsy, you have to sh have those in the bone marrow, it's a must. So if someone says, I was diagnosed with WM and they have not had a bone marrow, then I would say, I don't believe it. You haven't had the proper test done in order to diagnose WM. You must have the bone marrow biopsy in order to make a proper diagnosis. Furthermore, you have to show a, pr a protein in the blood called IgM. And those two are the, are the two things you must have present in order to have a diagnosis of WM. Now, just because you have WM doesn't mean that you might be sick from it. And so we divide WM, up, WM into what's called active or symptomatic WM, and that needs to be treated. And then we also have asymptomatic or smoldering WM, which does not require treatment. So after you make a diagnosis of WM, we categorize patients further into uh, active needing treatment, smoldering or asymptomatic, not requiring treatment. There's also a disease out there called MGUS with IgM protein. And that's, and I'll tell you, I'll show you a slide on that in a, in a minute here. But this, in my mind, is whenever I see this diagnosis, I think, hmm, I wonder if this patient has peripheral neuropathy. And that's a very, it's a closely related disease to the, to the true WMs, but there's this group of patients who have what's called IgM MGUS with peripheral neuropathy. And I would, I would uh, get, I would challenge that that might be the most challenging uh, group, of, group of patients to address and treat, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So what causes WM? Again, everybody asks, 
and, and most cases are sporadic. They occur by chance. So I tell my patients uh, the cause is bad luck. And, and it, it's true. I mean, you really, and the example I use with the diseases that I treat when they say, well, how do you know it's bad luck? I said, well, if I wanted to give it to Kim Jong-un, I couldn't do it. Uh, and so, uh, and I wouldn't want to do it now because he's going to maybe talk to us in a couple of weeks. But anyway, uh, so it occurs by bad luck. We talked about the familial uh, preponderance here. And the main risk factor for developing WM is this pre presence of something called IgM MGUS. Now, what the heck is MGUS? Uh, it's monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance there. And hopefully I bolded all the letters I did. Uh, but uh, that's a much more common condition. And if you have this condition, without neuropathy especially, you have a, your, your chance of having it turn into WM is about 2% per year. So these are uh, uh, fairly common conditions. And it's by far and away the, the leading predisposition, predisposing state to developing WM. So it's important to know that WM occurs in phases. It starts off as MGUS in everybody, goes through a smoldering stage, and many, but not all, of the smolderers go on to have symptomatic WM in their lifetime. There are strict definitions, and again, the important point is we only treat symptomatic WM. Now, the next few slides, which I'm going to show, I borrowed from Dr. Robert Kyle, who, who literally is the godfather of Waldenstrom's in our country, and he has these great slides that, that I've just taken, and, and they're, they're totally his, uh, but they're, they're very germane. So MGUS, IgM MGUS, has a very specific definition. It requires that your IgM protein in your blood not be too high. You have these cells called LPL cells, or lymphoplasmacytic cells, in your bone marrow, but they constitute fewer than 10% of the cells inside your bone marrow, fewer than 10%. And most importantly, you're not sick. These cells are not causing any damage. They're not causing fevers, chills, sweats. They're not causing swollen lymph nodes or a swollen spleen or your fingers to turn blue when you go outside or anything else. That is the definition of IgM MGUS. And again, the risk of progression to symptomatic disease is roughly 2% per year, 2% per year. Now, if the disease progresses a little bit more, then you have smoldering disease. And smoldering disease is defined as an M spike that's a, a little bit higher and more than 10% cells inside your bone marrow, more than 10% lymphoma cells in the bone marrow. But again, you're not sick from it. You're having no problems from it at all, no anemia, none of those symptoms. That's called smoldering disease. If you have smoldering disease, your risk of progression is higher. And over your lifetime, it might approach 70 or 80%. And certainly in the first few years after you're diagnosed, it goes up by, it's about 12% per year. So the smoldering patients, I watch very, very carefully, more carefully than my IgM MGUS patients. And so it's important to distinguish between these, these two disorders. I would say one of the most common con cons cons consultations that all WM doctors see is a smoldering patient to whom therapy has been recommended by a doctor because of the level of the IgM or the number of LPL cells inside the bone marrow. I would say it's one of the most common consults that we all see. So how does MGUS or smoldering uh, WM turn into symptomatic WM? Because wouldn't that be great to know? So if we knew the steps that occurred inside those cells that made these WM cells that were kind of dormant or just hanging out and not causing trouble, what made them begin to cause trouble, then perhaps we could intervene and prevent that. And the answer right now is we're not exactly sure but there's tremendous research going into trying to understand this. And I'm going to go th through these next slides very quickly and just preface them by saying that one of the uh, leading WM researchers in our country, there are many, is a woman named Dr. Irene Gobriel who works in Boston at the Dana-Farber. And she's very, very interested in obtaining samples from patients who have these so-called precursor states, IgM, MGUS, smoldering disease, that kind of thing, and, and studying those samples, just trying to understand the, the genetic events which are occurring that might make them turn into symptomatic disease. So these next few slides, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I'm going to go through them relatively quickly. She has something called P-Crowd. It's in your handouts, and, uh, and she wants to understand um, all these precursor blood cancers. Uh, this is how you do it. You send in samples. You complete a survey, uh, and that's uh, Dr. Gobriel right here. Um, uh, and, and then there's some websites here, so I just include that for you so that you have it there. 
Uh, and, and that's one example of someone who's uh, very committed to trying to understand this because ultimately, wouldn't that be the best way to address these diseases? I, the answer is yes. So how do these cells misbehave in WM, these LPL cells, those little cells I showed you under the microscope, what do they do that, that, that makes them uh, bad? Well, one thing is they're all identical clones of each other. And so they're identical clones, they don't follow the rules like we talked about, and they begin to occupy and take over the bone marrow. So, and you can have problems in WM either from the actual lymphoma cells taking over the bone marrow, or from this abnormal protein that these abnormal cells make called IgM. And, and so you can have uh, disease, uh, problems with this, so I'll show you in a slide in a, a minute or two here, and also problems from the IgM here. And a very rare complication that I just wanted to bring to your attention is that sometimes these LPL cells that tend to be really slow growing and, and relatively uh, um, uh, slow to progress and relatively slow in their causing of symptoms, sometimes they can mutate even more in a very nefarious fashion and become a very aggressive type of non-Hodgkin lymphoma called large B-cell lymphoma. And we have a word for that called transformation. If that happens, it's typically not subtle. Patients get very symptomatic, they have rapid growth of their lymph nodes, and their disease behaves in a way that's completely uncharacteristic for that patient. So just keep that in the back of your mind uh, as a very fortunately rare complication of this disease. What's IgM? So IgM is an antibody that's supposed, it's, a, it's a, one of the five main types of antibodies we have in our blood, and they're supposed to fight infection. And so uh, antibodies are made up of something called a heavy chain, which is this, this big Y-shaped thing here, and these little light chains that kind of hang on near the uh, outer parts of the Y here. And, and the typical antibodies are called IgG, IgA, IgE, and IgD. And these all look the same, don't they? But one of these things is not like the other, as they used to say in Sesame Street, and it's this IgM over here. And, uh, and IgM is, is actually a mixture of five of these antibodies that all stick together. And the issue with that is, is that this is a really big protein. And if, you're, and if your body makes a lot of this protein, then this protein can sometimes act like motor oil coursing through your blood vessels instead of like fluid or water, uh, more viscous fluid or water, and, and it can cause your blood to thicken. And we'll talk about that in a second. So IgM looks very different from the others. So the thing about this, these IgM is completely identical. It comes out of these clones of uh, B cells. And so we call it monoclonal. And so how do we detect this disease? Well, very often these proteins are discovered on a blood test called serum protein electrophoresis. And it's often ordered by a physician who, when checking a patient's routine blood test, says, hmm, the blood, the blood proteins are too high. I wonder what's going on here. And they call you back. And then they run this test called SPEP or SPEP. And then they say, I think you might have multiple myeloma. That's almost always what they say. And then you better go see a blood doctor. And we'll talk about this in, in a minute as well. So you can measure this IgM by two different blood tests called IgM or M-spike. Now, an IgM is something called an immunoglobulin. And when we quantify them, we call that QIG, quantitative immunoglobulins. And this is a test that's, that's always done in people like you. And typically, we, uh, it measures the absolute numbers of the three most common immunoglobulins, IgM, IgG, and IgA. In a WM patients, the IgM is high, and the other numbers are usually quite low, and these are reference ranges that you have here. And what's important is that low numbers of IgG and IgA can lead to increased infections. So it's very common for our patients, even when they're diagnosed in the smoldering stage sometimes, to have high levels of IgM and low levels of IgA or IgG, and that can be a problem sometimes. So let's talk about how IgM actually affects patients. An important point here is that I, WM affects every patient here differently. So your WM story is likely to be very different from the person sitting next to you, so keep that in mind. How do WM do, uh, patients go to their doctors? One of two ways. They either go because they're not feeling well, doctor, what's wrong with me? Let's do some blood work and figure this out. Or they're minding their own business and they get their blood drawn, the protein's high or they have a little bit of anemia, they, they get their SPEP done, and they get, re get referred to the hematology oncology doctor. And I call that an incidentaloma. That is not a medical term. But incidentaloma is why I, is, I was minding my own business, and somebody found a blood cancer in me, as, which is di very different from someone who went to the doctor because they were sick. And that, this occurs frequently in WM. What if you are sick with WM? What do you go to the doctor complaining about? What, what you complain about, for the most part, is tiredness. 
So fatigue uh, associated with anemia or a low red blood count is, is easily the most common reason that patients with WM require treatment and present to their physicians saying something's wrong. There are other uh, um, things that can happen, bleeding manifestations, bru bruisability is a common problem in WM. Sometimes weight loss, which is unintentional. So whenever I ask patients, have you had any, any unintentional weight loss without any prompt prompting, I would say 80% of them say, I wish. Uh, but, the, uh, it, but unintentional weight loss can be a sign of lymphoma, neuropathies, and then very rarely uh, visual disturbances such as blurry vision or Raynaud's phenomenon or diseases like that where you, you go out in cold weather and your fingertips, the circulation in your fingertips is bad. That happens sometimes. It's a rare, rare a complication. So a few minutes ago I said that you, when you have issues with WM, it can be either from a direct result of the lymphoma cells growing and taking over your bone marrow, or it can be from the production of this IgM or both. So what does that look like? So uh, if it infiltrates your bone marrow, you can sometimes also get an enlarged spleen or enlarged lymph nodes. Uh, and if it's mostly an IgM problem, you may have hyperviscosity or thick blood. You may have these uh, unusual diseases here that can affect your kidneys or your circulation. You may have easy bruisability or bleeding problems. And if the IgM is attacking your nerves, you might have peripheral neuropathy. And that's why I said that this disease affects everybody differently because some people have all these, some people have one of these. So this is a, uh, a, a, a nice uh, cartoon that I uh, borrowed from Steve, Dr. Steve Trion and Dr. Merlini, who's in Italy. Uh, and this, this shows those same WM cells, and, and the cells themselves, if they grow, can make enlarged lymph nodes or an enlarged spleen. Uh, they can also cause fatigue, sweats, unintentional weight loss. The IgM can cause a neuropathy, these unusual diseases here, uh, hyperviscosity, nosebleeds, headaches, that kind of stuff. So um, just a way of showing how that might happen. So let's move on and say, okay, a doctor suspects somebody has WM. What tests do we do? What tests are required? And so the first thing is blood work is always gets people in. But ma many physicians overlook the importance of urine, a, a urine test. And in WM patients, they should all have had at least once a test where they collect their urine in a bucket for 24 hours, a, a timed collection we call it. I call it the bucket test. And you bring it in to the doctor and you can do some special testing on that urine. And the reason for doing that isn't so much that WM frequently affects the kidney because it does not, but it occasionally affects the kidney. I think Dr. Gertz is going to talk either, I think tomorrow, on unusual manifestations of, of, of WM. And one of those is a blood disease called amyloidosis. Uh, which affects a substantial proportion of patients with WM. And if you're not thinking about or doing these urine tests, it, it can be overlooked. And so the urine test, I think, is important. When we do the bone marrow test now, uh, which is mandatory as I reviewed, there's a genetic test called MYD88 that really should be performed uh, on all uh, bone marrow biopsy specimens, at least the initial specimens, in WMers. Because I think it's going to be important for helping us make therapeutic decisions for many patients. There's an additional genetic test called CXCR4, and the, w, the, the veteran WMers ask their doctors about CXCR4, and, uh, and CXCR4 is a mutation that's a little, little bit less common than MYD88, uh, and it's a little more problematic to do testing on it. And so it's not, it is not routinely done, but I think in the future it may be more routinely done, so keep your eyes on it. Everyone who gets WM, uh, the doctors sometimes, they, because it's lymphoma, they say, oh, we should get a PET scan or we should, we should get a CAT scan, that kind of thing. And many of you have probably had those tests. Those tests rarely help us with WM because they're usually uh, pretty boring, to be honest with you. When you do a CT PET scan, it's pretty unusual to find any big, big lymph nodes or a big spleen or that kind of thing, but they're commonly done. The most important thing, I think, when a physician is evaluating a patient with WM is to do something pretty unusual, which is actually talk to and listen to your patient. Because patients will tell you almost every time if they require treatment or not. And so one thing I always, with my patients, they always come in when I see them, especially my watch and wait people. Uh, they'll come in and uh, the, the smolders who we're not treating, and, and I draw their labs the week before they come see me, and they come in and they say, Doc, how am I doing? And what they mean by that is, what's my IgM level? And I always, refer, I always say back to them, I say, I don't know, tell me how you're doing. And then, because I want to hear if they're complaining of anything. Because if, if they feel fine, 
then to be honest with you, I don't care what the IgM level is. So what, what the patient says is the most important thing by far and away. When all else fails, talk to your patient. Lab evaluation. There, these are a number of lab tests here that, are, uh, that most doctors will do. Um, and I'm going to discuss these more in the afternoon when we go through the understanding your lab test session. But uh, again, the tests here are the immunoglobulin test, viscosity, SPEP, light chains, uh, all these things here. I just put there in your handout. This is an SPEP picture. Uh, uh, which shows a normal SPEP. What an SPEP is, is when they take your serum and they stick it in this thing called a gel, and then they, they put electrodes on either side of the gel, and then they run a current through this, this gel, and the big protein, and the small proteins like albumin, and, and they, this goes, it's like uh, Arabic or, or Farsi, you read right to left here, uh, and so what happens is the big protein, the small lightweight proteins like albumin, go all the way to the end of the gel, and that's the major protein in our blood by far and away. And these are all normal proteins here. This is polyclonal, there's a nice mix of things. But when you have WM, you have this, this big old honking IgM that you're having, it's hardly gonna move at all, and it, it's all identical, it gets stuck right here. That's called an M-spike. So when you guys get, a, get your test pack called an M-spike, someone is looking at a, at, a, at a study like this and measuring that M-spike, and that's where the number is coming from. There's a test called a free light chain assay that is rarely helpful in WM. Occasionally it is. It's much more helpful in multiple myeloma and in amyloidosis, but it's less helpful in WM. But you may, uh, the test is out there, it's commonly done, and so I want you to just be aware of it. I'm not going to discuss it anymore. There's some other more important blood tests as well, and probably of these, I would say the most important blood tests to think about are if you have neuropathy, which is numb, numbness or tingling in your fingers or toes uh, most commonly, then there's some neuropathy blood tests called anti-MAG and anti-GM1 that are very important to do, uh, but they're only present in maybe, up, maybe 40, 50 percent of the patients who have neuropathy associated with w, WM or IgM, but they're important tests to do. Other tests here are, are sometimes done as well. The complete blood count is a very important blood test, and I'm going to talk about that in more detail this afternoon at the Understanding Your Blood Test session. But the major reason for doing the complete blood count is to see if somebody has anemia. Anemia is a low red blood count. And in WM, you can get anemia from any of two different reasons. You can get anemia from the fact that your bone marrow is being overrun by these LPL cells and there's no room for your normal red cells to be produced. Or you can have anemia from what I call Pac-Man, which is called hemolysis, which is your, these IgM, these, these immune cells, they will actually attack your own, your, your own red blood cells and destroy them. So there are tests that we can do to figure this out as well. So if you're anemic, it's important that the physician consider both potential causes that are here for anemia. And the other thing I want to mention here is that people with WM, if you're anemic, remember you have a problem with iron uh, low levels of iron that's more common in people who don't have WM as well. So it's important also to do iron studies if you have anemia with WM because that may be a simple fix. What's viscosity? Everyone talks about viscosity. And I have patients come in and say, what's my, what's my viscosity? And I say, well, do you have any headaches, blurred vision, uh, nosebleeds, are you short of breath, feeling poorly? No, uh, you don't have hyperviscosity. So it's not so much the number that determines hyperviscosity, it's the, whether or not the patient has symptoms that determines hyperviscosity. But what, 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 what viscosity is, is it measures the resistance of fluid uh, uh, to flow. And water flows readily, it's less viscous or thin. Oil flows less readily, uh, flows less readily, it's more viscous, they're, 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 they're uh, therefore thick or hyperviscous. And I, these IgM proteins, remember there's the five of them together, it's a very big molecule. If you get a lot of them, then they can make the blood very thick and viscous. And the symptoms are, these are the symptoms of hyperviscosity, headaches, nosebleeds, vision changes, uh, serious medical problems, it can affect the kidney or the lungs. And if this happens, patients will need plasmapheresis to remove the IgM and make patients to, uh, feel better rapidly, then they need to have their underlying disease treated effectively to prevent the overproduction of the IgM protein. So again, this is just to summarize the, the way we diagnose the disease. The major thing is you have to do a bone marrow biopsy and find LPL. You have to find IgM in the blood. And these days, I think we should pretty much be doing this genetic test called, for a gene called MYD88. Prognosis. Every patient asks about prognosis. 
And, and this is a, so there's a prognostic score that people have developed for WM. We do this for many blood cancers. Why do doctors do this? Because patients want to say, doc, what's it looking like for me? You know, how, you know, a guy like me, is it, do I have one year, do I have two years, do I have five years, do I have 10 years, what's it looking like? So what, what docs do is they, look, they, they comb through research studies and they come up with things they think are associated with worse prognosis versus a better prognosis. And they build them into a score and it's pretty validated. I don't think it's very helpful uh, because these, these scores were uh, developed uh, years, uh, several years ago when our, when our treatments were different. Our understanding of the disease was a little bit different and you have these prognostic scores that get utilized but I just don't pay much attention to it. And we have recent studies that show with modern therapies that the prognostic score really, just, really doesn't have any impact on how our patients do with disease. So people want to know how I'm going to do, and they, there's a score that's out there, but it's like I don't find it terribly helpful, and I don't know many docs that rely on this for counseling their patients, but it's out there. So treatment. I'm just checking my time here. Okay. Uh, so treatment's going to be covered elsewhere by really, really smart people. Uh, they're going to do a really good job. But the, 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 how, how treatment works in WM is that there's re really smart WM doctors who get together every couple years and they do what's called, they have a consensus panel. And they all get together and say, okay, what are reasons for treating versus not treating WM? And these become what are called consensus guidelines. And they're pretty widely accepted but not always widely practiced. And so there are do some doctors who aren't as familiar with them as others. So what are they? The first thing is a high IgM level by itself is not a reason to treat. You'll hear this sometimes. The doc, once my, doc said once my IgM hits 3,500, he's starting me on chemo, right? You hear that a lot. Or once I hit 4,000 or 5,000, I guess doc says I have to be treated. Mm, that's not a reason by itself. There has to be something else. What things? Anemia, so a hematocrit's a way of measuring anemia, and normal's about 40, except for where I live, in the Mile High City, normal's about 45. And so if you're, uh, if you're 30 or below and it's due to WM, that's the reason to treat people. A low platelet count, normal's 150 to 400,000. If you have a low platelet count, that can be a reason to treat. If you have symptoms, which symptoms? Fevers, chills, sweats, and fatigue debilitating fatigue, if you have those symptoms, that's a reason to treat. If you have symptomatic hyperviscosity, if you have neuropathy, or if your fingers turn blue in cold weather, or you have some irritation of your kidneys and other problems from these rare complications, those are reasons to treat as well. So just because you have WM and a high IgM does not mean you need to be treated. So the other thing that's interesting in this disease and how it behaves differently in everybody is that not everyone's WM cells inside their bone marrow are equally efficient in making IgM protein. Did you get that? So you can have, the, everyone in the room here can, it could have 30% or 40% or 60% lymphoma cells in your bone marrow, and you can have vastly different levels of IgM in your blood. How is that? Some clones of WM cells are much more efficient at making IgM than others. And we're beginning to understand this a little bit at the genetic level. But I'm going to show you a slide here uh, that, that is going to be, you're going to look at it and you're going to, you're going to give up right away when I show it to you. Uh, but don't give up. And we'll, we'll walk both sides of the room here with the pointer. So don't give up. So uh, but this is, is, this is a study that Dr. Treon did. And, and he measured in this panel, this is the IgM level. So in panel A here, you have IgMs of, you know, 4,000, 5,000, 10,000, 12,000, 14,000. And this is the percentage of lymphoma cells inside your bone marrow. This is zero. This is 100. And let's just look over here and say, here's someone who's got about 10% uh, WM cells in their bone marrow, but their IgM is 4,000 or 5,000, right? That can happen. Then you've got someone over here whose bone marrow is totally packed, 80% with with, uh, or 100% packed with WM cells, and their IgM is 400. So it can vary tremendously. So uh, it's, it's, again, your disease is your disease. Next one, hematocrit, measure of anemia. I'm gonna flip sides here. So here's hematocrit over here. Uh, this is the normal range here, right around 40, okay? And here's someone who's got a marrow that's 80% uh, packed with, with, with uh, 
uh, WM cells, and they're not very anemic. And here's a guy over here who's got hardly any, and, and he's severely anemic. So again, the level of IgM and the bone marrow disease, it's, it's not as easy as you think sometimes. This is why no matter how much IgM you measure and how much lymphoma is in your bone marrow, that's, that's not what determines if we need treatment or have symptomatic disease. It's the other stuff, right? It's, do you have anemia? Do you have symptoms? Do you have, you know, what problems are being caused? So I just show that to you guys to make the point. This is probably the most important thing that's happened in our field in the last decades. So in medicine, the more that we understand the genetic drivers, by genetic I mean the changes inside the DNA inside these cancer cells, the more we understand that, always the better the treatment gets. Always, always, always. And so, so in 2000, it can't be 12, was it 12? A while ago, Dr. Treon and some other labs, I think it might have been, uh, described a recurring genetic mutation that's present in virtually every patient with WM. Virtually every single patient. Not every, but just about. 90 plus percent. And it's called MYD88. And this is a mutation that occurs, and, and this is really big, big news. And so, what about it? Well, it's a, this is a mutation that you're not born with. It occurs by chance over your lifetime, and it sets the table in a big way for WM to develop. Uh, there's an additional mutation called CXCR4 that occurs in about a third of patients. And most patients with WM, 90 plus percent, have this classic MYD88 mutation called L265P. About 10% of you do not. If you don't have it, then a, what goes off in my head if I don't find uh, MYD88 mutation is, hmm, maybe it's just a different type of MYD88 mutation. And if I send some stuff to Steve Treon and Jorge Castillo in Boston, they can find a different mutation in the MYD88 gene. Or, hmm, I wonder if this patient doesn't have WM. Could they have IgM myeloma, which is really rare, but that goes through my head as well. Or maybe they're one of these patients with WM, they truly have WM, but their MYD88 just is not mutated. But you have to go through that thinking exercise for the negative patients. Just to confuse matters further, other types of non-Hodgkin lymphomas can have MYD88, such as marginal zone lymphoma, but it's much, much less common to find in that setting. So the MYD88 is really important, and it's led to treatment advances that are absolutely unbelievable in WM already, and continue to, progress, and continue to uh, uh, go on, and that'll be addressed later in, uh, in the sessions today. Every year, uh, pe people want to know, what about familial WM? I think you have Dr. McMaster speaking this year, which is amazing. Uh, so Dr. Mary McMaster is at the National Cancer Institute, and she is really, really interested in studying families that have WM. Um, and so uh, uh, you know, that'll be great to hear from her. But again, going back to Dr. Kyle, when, when patients ask, okay, I have WM, do, do my brothers and sisters need to get checked? Do my children need to get checked? What Dr. Kyle always says, their risk is that they have no increased risk. They have no increased risk. And, and the way you understand this is through something called relative risk. And so if you have a one in a million disease, but you have a three in a million disease, let's just say it's a one in a million, and let's just say that you have, that your kids have a three or five times higher chance of getting that disease, or 10, then their chance is three in a million, or five in a million, or 10 in a million. There's no reason to test people for something that, that uncommon. So if, if you have it in, and you think it might run in your family, you do not need to test your first degree relatives. They just need to know that when they go to the doctor, and report, you know, having the routine checkup, say, you know, Uncle Bernie's got WM. Uh, that's, that's as much as you need to take it. Uh, and at this point, I'm going to show a slide of downtown, uh, downtown Chicago, which is, and Rosemont is not quite downtown, but it's, it's close. And, uh, and I'm going to stop for and answer any questions that we might have. Thank you. I was diagnosed at 16 with an IgM over 7,000. Okay. And the only symptom I had was the anemia, but vision problems. Uh -huh. So they started, and I did my yep. six mo months of chemo. After and plasmapheresis, probably. No, they did not do that. Ooh, okay. what, what chemo did they give you? 
uh, cytoxin. Anything with rituxin in it? Yes, and rituxin. Okay. And I'm currently doing maintenance of rituxin, okay. which I know that's kind of controversial too. Okay. My question is that before I started all this, I felt fine. I was teach I teach kindergarten, so I'm tired anyway. But. <laughs> I actually feel worse now. I mean, I wake up, I can't even walk, my legs ache, and I don't know if that's typical or if did, that is a side effect of the rituxin. Did you get Velcade? No, I did not. I did cytoxin. Cytoxin, rituxin, dexamethasone? Yes, that's exactly what I did. And then you, now you're on, ma and you're on maintenance for Every three months. And when did you start maintenance? Uh, I'm a year and a half into it. Okay, that, that needs some explaining. Uh, I mean, that's, that's not typical. It's not, yeah, okay. and so it's, uh, that So means, would you continue the maintenance? I mean, I only have like two more. Yeah, so ma maintenance is, re is reasonable to do. So okay. the, the guys in Boston have data that suggests that maintenance is a good idea. Some docs subscribe to it, some don't. It's not, not one of those things where we can be dogmatic, but it's totally reasonable to do. I doubt the rituxin is making you feel poorly. So uh, what is yeah. causing this that's severe? A, that, that's, a, that's the question. It's, that, not, it's not a common thing then? No, it's not common okay. at all. That requires, do you have a weird neuropathy? Um, it's not really neuropathy. I mean, I don't have the aches, tingling. Of me. I just cannot walk. Yeah, yeah and, and so that's that, that's more challenging than. So what do just talk, talk to the doctor? I mean, I've doctor, told him I have that, but yeah, talk to your doctor or go see a WM person and, and let him or her. So I'm in Utah. So the closest one would obviously be be Colorado or. Yeah. So there's a, there's a good myeloma doctor at University of Utah. Um, I don't know how much WM he does, but a lot, a lot of MM doctors are good WM doctors. But the IWMF has on their website a list of WM, you know, specialists right. that are really into this. And no yeah, one in Utah. Yeah. But okay, we're, we're, we're happy to see I'll you. I'll check in it. Hi, thank you for that presentation. Um, this is a question about uh, neuropathy issues. You know, if you have that, you know it. I mean, symptomatically. And in my case, it's not just tingling. It's Pretty significant pain in the feet. Not sure whether that's from the the actual yes. Waldenstrom's or yes. from the uh, bortezomib that was part of the rituxan, bortezomib, dexamethasone treatments okay. that were had. But in any case, what my question is is that you mentioned uh, some tests for neuropathy, yes. the anti-MAG, the GM1, whatever. Yes. Is there any reason to do that testing yes. if you have the if you have that problem, and does that tell you anything about how to treat it? Yes, because, uh, I mean, bortezomib or Velcade is a drug that can cause neuropathy, including painful neuropathy. So the question would be, did you have the painful neuropathy prior to being treated with chemotherapy? No. Then it almost certainly is treatment related. Uh, but if you wanted to exclude the possibility that you have it related to your underlying WM, then, then the blood tests are helpful, but not totally helpful in that regard. I mean, that they, they, if, they're, if they show that they're there, then you do have a neuropathy related to your, I, your IgM. Okay. But if those blood tests are negative, it does not exclude that you have neuropathy related to WM. But I would okay. say if you didn't have it before, I always mm -hmm. tell my patients this, mm -hmm. if you have a problem now, mm -hmm. you didn't have it before, I gave it to you mm -hmm. and with chemo. And that's true with bortezomib in the setting. So yeah. this is one of those things where it may take a long time to settle mm -hmm. down or it may not settle down. Right. Okay. Thank you. This is a fairly basic question, I think, so hopefully this is the right place to ask it. Um, we often uh, shorten the name of the disease to WM because it's a mouthful. We un I understand that Waldenstrom's is named after the doctor that discovered it. Yes. Can you unpack the word macroglobulinemia, which is a mouthful <laughs> yes, and difficult yes. to say? Okay, remember those IG things that we, should, that we looked at, the IgAs and IgGs and IgGs? Yes. IgEs, they're immunoglobulins immuno-immune system mm -hmm. globulin type of protein. So if you have, so one we'll just call a, a little globulin. Mm -hmm. If there's the IgM that's got five of them all connected, we'll call that a macroglobulin. That's where that came from. So macroglobulinemia, that pentamer, those five IgMs all stuck together, that's where the term came from. Got it, thank and you. That, and that's why we say WM. <laughs> In a balance disorder like bilateral vestibular dysfunction, can that be caused by Waldenstrom's or the treatment of Waldenstrom's? Yeah, um, that's difficult. 
The Waldenstrom sometimes, I didn't put this in my slides, can affect the central nervous system sometimes. And that has a name called Bing, like Dave Bing, the former Detroit Piston, Bing Neal syndrome. Hmm. Uh, but I haven't seen it present the sibling, I haven't seen it present that way. I would have to look that up to be honest with you. Can it be a complication of WM otherwise? For example, a, a weird type of neuropathy, it's possible. But that's really unusual. And I certainly have never recognized that as a WM complication in any, any of my patients. It just this that, that might be a good question for Dr. Castillo when he you know he, he sees I see this many WM patients, he sees okay. that many WM patients. And maybe he or Dr. Trion have recognized that, but I'm not very much help there. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi, good morning. Good morning. I, I am the support group leader from India. And wow. um, a member from India asked me to ask you a question, although it's specific. Okay. Could I read it out? Yes, of course. Thank you. I am 69 years old and was diagnosed when I was 61. I feel fine, although I do have a question. And that is, after my treatment of R CHOP, beginning May 2010, and eight maintenances of rituximab uh -huh. over two years, my IgM went down from 4865 to 129. Now, eight years later, it says it stays well within range at 124. However, the IgA levels are coming down, and now at 43, and IgG going up at 1643 are both going out of range. What does this indicate, and what do I keep an eye out open for? Are so, there any tests I should be doing? Uh, so I want to rephrase that. So they got RCHOP, which is a treatment that we don't use much here in the States for WM anymore, but it worked really well, <laughs> made the IgM go down, and the IgM is staying suppressed, and the IgG was going up, is that what I understood? Yes. The IgG. The I um, the IgM went down, okay. and the IgA, IgA came down, okay. however IgG yes. is going up. Going up. Yes. So I would say good, because uh, <laughs> so very often with rituxan, rituximab, rituximab is, an, is a treatment that drives down all the, anything IgG, I, Ig gets driven down by rituxan, IgA, IgG, and all those things go down. And when you're on rituxan, they stay down. When you're off rituxan for a long period of time, they can rise, and that equals uh, some recovery of normal immunity, some re recovery of the normal immune system. So I think if your, your patient sounds like they're doing fine, I, I would say congratulations. Thank you. Okay. I should really appreciate it, I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Jason. Um, I'm a IgM MGUS, I, I snuck in. <laughs> um, so, uh, not Waldenstrom's uh, yet. Uh, my question is, my IgM is fairly low, about 460. Um, however, I have small fiber and large fiber neuropathies, pain, and uh, Raynaud syndrome. Yeah. Um, my issue is my doctors are treating the numbers, right? They say, you're 462, you're great, don't worry about it, go home. Yeah. Um, going home doesn't help, so what can I do? Yeah, you, <laughs> so you have, you have an IgM neuropathy. Mm -hmm. You have IgM MGUS with neuropathy, which again is one of the most frustrating disorders uh, for physicians. And I can't even begin to think what it must be like to be the patient who has it, because it's, it's super challenging for us and for the patients. And so I always say, if, if you're symptomatic enough, you should be treated. Now that's where things get interesting because there's no one treatment that we all use for IgM neuropathies. It can vary from trying rituximab therapy to sometimes we'll do a plasmapheresis and see if it helps temporarily. Um, cytoxin, cyclophosphamide, uh, IVIG, the different things that we try. But if you're symptomatic at the point where you say, I want you to fix it, doc, then you get treated. And again, the IgM level doesn't help us here because we know, we, we know you have an IgM neuropathy, okay? And, and so knowing what your IgM is doing, it doesn't matter, you have a problem, and is the problem severe enough where you want the doctor to give you something to try and fix it? That's the question. So you should see someone that does, who understands that. Are you taking patients? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm in Colorado, where do you live? 
I live in Minneapolis. I don't care if oh, you're on the far yeah, side of the moon. Really good, yeah, there's <laughs> some amazing doctors in the state of Minnesota for WM okay. who understand neuropathy. All right, thanks. Yeah. Morning, doctor. Um, thank you for your presentation. It was okay. very informative. Um, during your presentation, you mentioned that IgG and IgA are typically, you know, pretty low, increases yes. your risk to, uh, of infection. Yes. Um, I'm curious what your opinion of IVIG is, what sure. you see the risks are, and how long you should be on it. Sure. So IVIG is, is a pooled uh, bags of antibody proteins, of immunoglobulins, that you can get as a transfusion in your doctor's office, um, or sometimes at home. Um, depending, uh, and, and that can be given to people who have low levels of their own antibodies like IgG or IgA. And so some doctors see a low number and they go, oh my Lord above, we have to give this person IVIG because their numbers are low. When in fact, the, the recommendations are, if your numbers are low, we, again, we have to talk to the patient uh, and we have to say, are you having more, and not just more, but more severe infections than everybody else out there? And if you're having severe sinus, lung infections, blood infections, hospitalizations, I mean, and way more than everybody else, then re replacing with IVIG for those low levels is a good idea. And what I do with a lot of my patients who are low and have these repetitive infections is I replace them from October to April because the cold and flu season in our hemisphere is October to April. And so I do a lot of that in my patients, but I'm very, I don't give anyone IVIG just because their numbers are low. What are the risks? The risks are you have to come to the office uh, and it's expensive. They're, they're an occasional person that feels kind of yucky the day after they get it. That's unusual. The risks are quite small. And so it's, it's just a matter of, I think there's probably a little more IVIG being given out there to people who probably don't really need it. Uh, but it can be very helpful for people that, re that really do need it. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Newly diagnosed IgM in the 800s, bone marrow about 15%. Okay. I think I've been misdiagnosed for a number of years with chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. Uh -huh. I have days that I feel fantastic, like there's nothing wrong, and there's other days that I can't get out of bed. My head feels like it's going to explode, and I'm so dizzy I can't even focus. Um, I'm very adverse to doing any kind of chemo or anything else possible. So my question is, what can we do to help ourselves other than treatment and chemicals? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I was told last October when I was diagnosed that diet makes no difference, didn't matter next day, I'm vegan. And they were right, it doesn't make any difference so far. <laughs> but I'm, st I'm staying that way for other reasons. But just practically what can we do for ourselves to help our conditions yeah it's uh and your your condition is super challenging because fatigue people sometimes get used to fatigue and the aches and they just sort of say it becomes the new normal and and, and the question i'll ask my patient are you so fatigued that you want me to treat you with stuff that i have right and, that, and they'll say well i'm not that fatigued or they say yeah I, I want you to treat me now let's try and get better what can you do that's not related to direct treatment um, I would say that exercise is huge. Exercise and uh, um, meditation, you know, psychological things, those are huge. And extra, extra, anytime exercise has been evaluated for any cancer-related symptom, exercise is always shown to be positive. And exercise takes so many forms. I think we have an exercise session this morning or midday or something as well. So that would be it. The other thing is for patients like you, a lot of times I'll sit down and say, let's, let's talk about the treatments I have and what your concerns are. Because I might be able to make you feel better. What are your, what are your worries? What are your concerns? Are they short term? Are they long term? A gen is it a general aversion to anything that could be called chemotherapy? Or what is it? And I, I would explore that and say, you know, boy, if you're bad enough, maybe it's worth trying something or taking a chance. Just and, uh, um, but that's a tough situation. I'd say exercise, though, and and meditation, psychological stuff. All right, thank you. And a follow-up to exercise, if you don't mind, because yeah. I've always been very physically active, doing yeah. yoga, walking, yeah. swimming, all of that. You're doing it. Once upon a time, that was a two-hour exercise, and now 30 minutes, I'm just wiped out, and it might take several days to recover from a 30-minute yeah. so swim. Or I've something. had so patients like you over the years, and uh, 
I'd sit, and sometimes I t it took me two years to talk him into treatment. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and okay. I think I, I would say, I bet we can make you feel better. Thank yeah. you, Doctor. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take those last two questions. Okay. Uh, good morning, Doctor. For uh, smoldering uh, WM and uh, the presence of very, very mild peripheral neuropathy, when does one become concerned about the potential of nerve damage? Yeah, so the, I, again, IGM neuropathies are really the most challenging situation that we, we face with these IGM diseases. And, and the more, the longer you've had them, the more difficult they are to fix if you try to treat them, okay? So if I see someone who's had, hey doc, I've had neuropathy since 2006, I'm not gonna fix that with any treatment. And so I, again, it's a threshold thing. If you're able to button buttons, function, do things, sleep at night without nerve pain, you you're, can do all the things you wanna do, I'm gonna leave you alone. If you say, doc, this is bothering me so much, it's really affecting my Acti activities of daily living, that's a term we use in medicine, ADLs, I'm going to say, yeah, maybe we should try to fix this. So, so effectively, with a continual mild neuropathy, there, there is continuing nerve damage going on there, yeah, is that right? Yeah, but again, you may have, that may go on for 20 years and be very slowly progressive and never amount to a, a serious problem. And the question always is, does it rise to the level where I need to give you something that could be toxic to try and fix it? Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm interested in the role of iron deficiency. Yeah. Um, and I've been anemic and iron deficient for several years, and I'm treated with um, infusions, uh, iron infusions, mm -hmm. um, every three to four months. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping there was a way to figure out why and, yeah. and what yeah. else can be Done, and I know there's yeah. some issue about the liver and hepcidin, yeah, but very, I, don't, yeah, you're, you're, I don't understand all this. I don't need to teach you anything about that. You, you got it. The, uh, um, so WMers do have a problem with this protein called hepcidin that helps us turn over and process liver in our bodies. But at the end of the day, if you have that, what we do is we make sure that you have enough iron in your body. And that's what you do. And so if you're on infusions, uh, that's probably taking care of it. Now, some people, there, there are many different ways to get iron deficient. Mm -hmm. And there are way more common ways than this hepcidin problem associated with WM. A lot of people have small little blood vessels that just intermittently bleed in our intestines. We have that. Some, some of us are on, on aspirin all the time. We have chronic low level blood loss from aspirin. Those are much more common reasons for iron deficiency. So the first thing that any good doctor says if they have it in their head when, they have, when, there's, when there's a patient with iron deficiency is, I need to make sure this person doesn't have colon cancer or stomach cancer and do uh, a colonoscopy and an upper endoscopy. And if you know that they don't have that, then you can start thinking about other unusual causes of iron deficiency, such as hepcidin problems or these small little blood vessels that bleed. But if you're getting your levels of iron checked and you're getting repleted with iron, uh, with the with a copper colored bag of stuff, you're you're you're, you're fine. You're good. Okay, I was Nothing just else hoping to, to find a, the reason and maybe yeah, not have to keep it's, doing that. Yeah, no. Um, you, is there a reason that we can find that it makes you not have to do that? No. Okay. Thank you. It doesn't exist. <laughs> okay. Please join me in Thank thanking Dr. Mattis. <laughs>